Thank you for that. And Prudy, I feel yeah, I was crying here too. I, I get all I'm getting all emotional, so <laughs> I feel you, brother. Thank you. It's good to be here with you guys today, even uh, if virtual reality has become our only reality, it is good that we have the technology to spend a few moments together with one another and encouraging each other and uh, spend a few moments in prayer and in the Word. And we do, uh, our hearts have been knit together and uh, there, there is a bond there that's not unlike uh, the bond that we're going to see today in the Scripture as we look at Philippians chapter 2. Uh, Arnold, have you given me the opportunity to uh, share my screen? Do I have that now? If you can just give me a thumbs up, I'll... Okay, uh, give me just a moment. We're all learning our new technology here, so uh, let's see. I think this is where I want. And bear with me just a second. This one. And this one. Yay, we're there. Good. Okay. Well, as Arnold gave uh, the introduction, we are making our way through the book of Philippians. Uh, this is a series really that came about because of our situation with Corona. As most of you know, we would be uh, making our way through our Easter message series. And uh, we put that to the side for now because we felt like this was maybe a, a bit more fitting for our current situation. So I, I really do pray today that as we look at this chapter number two in Philippians, that it's going to minister to to where you're at with uh, Corona. And so uh, let's go ahead and get started. And we're going to be looking at Philippians chapter two, verses one to 11 today. That's our passage. I'm not going to take the time to read that right now. Um, but we will get to that as we make our way through the message today. And uh, if you want to go ahead and get that open on your Bible, if you have a, a hard copy Bible in front of you, or if you're maybe a little bit more tech savvy than I am and you know how to open that and keep Zoom open on your device at the same time, you go ahead and go for that. But if not, no worries. We will have the uh, verses on the screen when they uh, come into factor in the message today. So let's go ahead and begin. Um, how is everyone? We kind of have checked in a little bit here at the beginning of the message or the beginning of the experience today. But again, if you will just continue to put your comments in the chat room, I may not be able to see those right now, but we will get to those later. Want to know how you're doing. I, I, for one, I'll be honest with you, I am experiencing cabin fever. I do not like to be cooped up in the house for, for very long. My normal schedule with our busy family as me going in and out of the house as the taxi driver, chauffeur, Uber driver, whatever you want to call me, there's no pay involved. I wish there was. I wish we could work out that contract. But I am in and out of the house constantly through the day, shuttling kids to and from school. And so everything has come to a standstill for us. And then when, with enhanced quarantine, you know, I have still been able to get out and enjoy my run up until this past Friday when I could no longer run outside of our village. By the way, last week when I was running, um, I happened to run by a group of kids and they were sitting on their front porch. And when I was coming back in from my run, the sun caught me just right, just right. And I don't know about you, but when the sun is so bright in my eyes, it makes me sneeze. It's just a natural response. It's like instantaneous. You don't think about it. You just sneeze. And I sneeze really loud when I sneeze. And so these two kids are <laughs> sitting on their porch as I'm coming by and I sneeze and it's like, oi! And they like stood up and ran, They're like scattered just like immediately. Today, when you sneeze or cough in public, it's like in the days right after 9-11, if someone were to stand up in the middle of a crowded room and, and yell bomb, it is the exact same response. So please be careful, even if you don't have corona, if you happen to be outside and you sneeze and you cough around people, panic could ensue. So just be mindful of that, even if you don't have corona, be mindful of your coughing and your sneezing. Someone might get trampled to death. We don't want that to happen at Life City or anywhere else. But I have absolute cabin fever, and I cannot wait, hardly wait, until enhanced quarantine is over. One of the things that I like to do to actually pass time is to watch sports. But right now, there's not even any sports on TV. There's no 
NBA, it's been canceled. If you're an American, you like Major League Baseball, there's no baseball. There's no PBA here in the Philippines. I don't even think they're doing NASCAR right now back in the States. Everything has been just put on the shelf for this season of life. And so uh, we don't even have sports to enjoy. And by the way, my, my favorite sport, if anybody ever wants to buy me a birthday present or a uh, Christmas gift or any of those kind of things, I, I'm not dropping hints here. Uh, well, maybe. Uh, I love American football, and my team is the Arizona Cardinals. We lived in Arizona for 12 years, and I grew to love these lovable losers, the Arizona Cardinals. Here's the thing with the Cardinals. They historically are a losing team. They, they're really, truly a horrible team, but occasionally – just occasionally, there is a glimpse of greatness. And that is the thing with the Cardinals. Maybe your team is like this too, whatever sport you follow, whatever your team is. Maybe they're just historically a horrible team. But every once in a while, they're really good. They get hot. And if they're good, they're fantastic. They're like at the top of their game. But if they're horrible, they're horrible. And most of the time, the Arizona Cardinals are absolutely horrible. But as we lived there, there were a couple of times where they actually had really good seasons. And some of that time came under the tenure of their coach, uh, Bruce Arians. Now, Bruce Arians is a really uh, interesting guy. He has spent 38 years around professional football. 38 years in any career is a really, really long time. And so he's been in and around professional sports, professional football for 38 years. And for 38 years, he kept getting passed up for his opportunity at the head job to become the head coach. For 38 years, teams would look at him and say, eh, uh, somebody else. Uh, let's pass on Bruce Arians. Nobody wanted to touch this guy and give him his opportunity to be a head coach. Well, finally, in 2013, the Arizona Cardinals gave him his shot. And you better believe that when Bruce Arians stepped into the role of head coach, he came to that position with a chip on his shoulder. He had something that he wanted to prove to the world, to prove to all those teams that had passed him up over the years. He was going to coach to win, and his players were going to play to win the game. And they were going to play to win on every play, on every down, on every pass, on every run, on every tackle, on every defensive stance. They were going to play to win. Bruce Arians became one of the most aggressive play callers and coaches in NFL history during his time at the Arizona Cardinals. And while he was there, he knew that if he was going to get the Cardinals to transform from a losing team to a winning team, it was going to begin, have to begin with their mindset. He was going to have to change the culture of this team. The Arizona Cardinals were going to not, not only have to believe that they could win, but they were going to have to believe that they would win. They would win if they would play to win. And so that's what Bruce Arians did. He changed the culture of the Arizona Cardinals, and he knew that it started with the mind. And so this became the mantra of the Arizona Cardinals while Bruce Arians was there. No risk it, no biscuit, baby. No risk it, no biscuit. Let me explain what this means. For those of you that didn't grow up around American cartoons and may not uh, know kind of what he's getting at here, this basically comes from the Scooby-Doo cartoon. Anybody ever seen Scooby-Doo before from Hanna-Barbera? Scooby-Doo was a cartoon about a group of teenagers who went around solving mysteries. There was always a mystery to be solved about a monster or a creature or a ghost, and they're always getting into trouble. And they had a pet dog, and the pet dog's name was Scooby-Doo. And Scooby-Doo would always get involved in the story and solving the mystery. But the problem was Scooby-Doo was an absolute coward. But he liked to eat. And he, his favorite snack of all time, as Leia puts food to, <laughs> food to her mouth, it was perfect timing, right on cue. His favorite snack was Scooby Snacks. Scooby Snacks are dog biscuits. So they would use Scooby Snacks to bribe Scooby to do something brave, to take a risk, to do something that was ordinarily out of his character. But guess what? If he didn't do it, there was no Scooby Snack. No risk it, no biscuit, baby. No risk it, no biscuit. And it's a true statement because history teaches us 
that fortune favors the brave. It does. Fortune favors the brave. And in 2014, one year after being there with the Arizona Cardinals, we had one of the most electrifying seasons uh, in the history of the team. 63-year-old Bruce Arians was named NFL Head Coach of the Year as a result of it. And one year later, even a more electrifying season, we had not only a winning year, but we became the NFC Western Division champions. We missed the Super Bowl by just one game. Cy Young. Fortune favors the brave. It's not only true for football. It's not only true for sports. It's true for life. It's true for you and me in the Christian life. And so today, as we look at Philippians chapter 2, I'm going to stretch this analogy of sport. And I'm going to be applying it to Paul's message uh, to the Philippians and his message to you and us today as we're facing down COVID-19. And in between the lines of Paul's letter, I think that Paul has a mantra that is not all that dissimilar from Bruce Arians. I think Paul would agree with Bruce Arians, no risk it, no biscuit. So let's take a look at Philippians chapter 2. For the purpose of our message today in this sports analogy, uh, Paul is going to be our head coach. He is the head coach, and Philippians is a letter that he is writing to his team, uh, the church in Philippi. And as we learned last week from Pastor Arnold, uh, Paul's in prison right now. He's back in Rome, and he's, he's serving uh, two years under house arrest. And why is he in prison? Well, Paul is in prison for doing this very thing, for being brave and for taking risk and for being faithful in sharing the gospel no matter the cost. Uh, Paul is such a risk taker that not only is he in prison for sharing the gospel, but he's actually sharing the gospel while he's in prison with those that are holding him in prison and with those that have the ability to keep him in prison or to release him or to even to execute him. Paul was crazy brave. Paul knew how to take risk. And his situation was not that different from our current situation under enhanced quarantine. Under house arrest, his movements, his freedom, they were all limited. His interactions with others, limited. And when he couldn't be with the people that he loved and that he really cared about in person, Paul didn't have Facebook and he didn't have Zoom like we have and we're using today. The only thing he had was pen and paper. So Paul would sit down and he would write letters. And during his time in prison in Rome, he wrote at least four letters that we have in our Bibles today. He probably wrote more letters than that, but four of them have made their way into our Bibles. And through his letters, and through his gospel sharing to those that kept him in prison, Paul was making the very most of his opportunities under house arrest. Paul took great risks because he felt the future possibility of reward was worth it. And he was challenging the church in Philippi by his words, and more importantly, by his example, to go and to do the same. As we read through the book of Philippians, it becomes really obvious really quick how much Paul and the church at Philippi cared for each other. Paul was responsible for giving these folks the gospel. Uh, he had traveled there during his second missionary journey, and this was actually the first time the gospel had ever been given to folks in Europe. Uh, where he was in Philippi, it's part of Macedonia, which is a part of modern-day Europe. The Philippians had witnessed firsthand Paul's love for them and his love for the gospel and the price that he was willing to pay to share the gospel. Uh, Paul also happened to spend time in prison while he was there in Philippi on that missionary journey. As a matter of fact, it seems almost everywhere that Paul went, he ended up spending some time in jail or at the very least being persecuted for his faith. As a result, there was this unbreakable bond of affection and gratitude uh, between the church at Philippi and the Apostle Paul. In writing from prison, Paul is trying to leverage that bond that he has with the church at Philippi. He wants to use it not for his own personal benefit, but for their benefit. And as their head coach, he wants them to continue to grow 
He wants to see the team continue to grow. He wants them to follow his example and to play the game to win. He wants them to win. Philippians chapter 2, verses 1 and 2. So if there is any encouragement in Christ, any comfort from love, any participation in the Spirit, any affection and sympathy, complete my joy by being of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord, and of one mind. That phrase, same mind, one mind, becomes very important in the book of Philippians. Some theologians say that that phrase is the key to understanding the message of the entire book. It's represented by the Greek word phronio, and it appears 10 times in Philippians, and it's translated over and over, kind of the same mind, same mind, one mind, sometimes translated like-minded, depending upon the translation that you have. And uh, the basic meaning of this word phronio is, uh, in, in Greek, uh, the basic meaning is developing a, an opinion or an attitude after careful thought. Developing an opinion or an attitude after careful thought. So as we consider our current situation today, let me ask you a personal question. Um, what is it that's shaping your opinion of Corona and your attitude of Corona and life in general right now? Is it what you see happening around you or maybe what's not happening around you right now? Is it the grumblings of friends and family members that are having the largest, biggest impact on your personal attitude? Is it the restrictions that are being placed upon you by our leaders? Is it the constant onslaught of 24 seven COVID-19 news? Is there nothing else happening in the world besides Corona right now? As believers without ignoring all these other things, because some of them are really important. I mean, we have to honor our leaders. God has placed them in these positions and we need to be obedient and respectful to the, the restrictions that they place down. They're just trying to keep people safe. And there are things that personally we need to do to keep ourselves safe and keep ourselves informed. But this, the point I'm trying to make here is can we as a church, as followers of Jesus, can we let our prevailing attitude be shaped by something that's, well, it's more transcendent. It's more everlasting. Say something like God's word, or maybe the example of other heroes of the faith, like Apostle Paul. Can these things be what really shape the attitude of our hearts and our minds? Back to our sports analogy, Coach Paul is telling Team Philippi, and he's telling us today that you've got to get your mind right to win. You've got to have your mind in the game, and you've got to get your mind right to win. And just like Coach Arians transformed the losing Arizona Cardinals into a winning team by focusing on mindset first, the same is true for you and me. If our mindset is broken, our results are going to be broken as well. Because wrong attitudes always lead to wrong actions. Wrong attitudes will only produce wrong actions. And here is one of the wrong actions that we're beginning to see a lot of in the news these days. And this is, this is funny, but it's also really kind of sad. I don't know if it's happening that much here in the Philippines with toilet paper as it is in the U.S., but what I can't find when I go to the grocery store is I can't find alcohol. I can't find any rubbing alcohol. It is all gone. I don't think there's another drop left to be purchased anywhere in the Philippines, anywhere. So again, this is really kind of sad, but it is funny. When people give in to fear, when people give in to panic, they start to think irrationally. And sooner or later, as they think irrationally, they're eventually going to begin to act irrationally and hoarding Hoarding toilet paper is irrational. I don't know if you've seen this guy. He's a somewhat popular YouTuber, and he has hoarded thousands of rolls of toilet paper in his apartment. And, you know, like any YouTuber, he can't resist the temptation, and he can't keep his mouth shut. So he has to go online to get a little bit of pathetic self-validation and to brag to the world about his stash of all this toilet paper. Well, much to his surprise and much to his horror, netizens turned on this guy and called him out for being greedy and for being insensitive to others. How can I put this? Uh, sanitary needs. So 
don't hoard toilet paper. Right? This guy, his attitude is also equally wrong. I'll give you a chance to read that there. But he is pretty funny. <laughs> He's coming for your toilet paper. So again, we've got to get our mind right to win because wrong attitudes will always produce wrong actions. Continuing on with our passage today, do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility, right mind, count others more significant than yourselves, right action. Let us not look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Now, toilet paper hoarders would do really well to memorize these verses. From this verse, we can see that Paul is talking about having the right mind. He's talking about a mind that is characterized by humility, a mind that is characterized by selflessness. So back to sports, Coach Paul is saying, don't be a ball hog. Don't be a contract holdout who's only in it for the money. Put the needs of the team and your teammates before your own. Be a team player who plays for a team victory and not just for individual stats. So what does genuine humility look like? And for a number of years, I will tell you, I, I really didn't understand what humility was all about. I thought humility was exactly what I'm getting ready to tell you. It's not. Humility is not about self-deprecation. Humility is about others' elevation. Humility doesn't mean demeaning your personal value. When you do that, you discredit God's creation. You discredit God's gifts and abilities that he's given you. He's given each of his gifts and abilities to use within the body. True humility operates from a position of strength and from knowing who we are in Christ and then willfully helping others realize the same for themselves by putting them first, by helping to elevate them. In the last chapter of, in, I'm, sorry, I'm sorry, in the last quarter of the third century, uh, the plague of Cyprian, smallpox, swept across the Roman Empire. And historians record that death tolls in Rome alone were 5,000 people per day. I mean, the bodies were stacking up. And leading up to the plague, the Roman Emperor Decius, he was executing this campaign against Christians, this persecution campaign. And when the plague hit, he actually blamed the Christians for the plague. But then to his shock and to his dismay, instead of running away from the city like everybody else when the plague came, Christians ran toward the plague. They ran toward the plague to help and to minister to the needs of their persecutors. New Testament and early church historian Candida Moss, she describes it like this. She says, the epidemic that seemed like the end of the world actually promoted the spread of Christianity. By their actions in the face of possible death, Christians showed their neighbors that Christianity is worth dying for. The Roman believers put the needs of their persecutors first, and they did it at great personal risk. And so you and me, you know, COVID-19, I'm not really trying to draw a parallel exactly between COVID-19 and the plague, because I don't really feel the same way the plague and COVID-19. I don't think it's at the same level. But as we look around us today, as we look around the world suffering from corona, there are a lot of people that could really use some elevating right now. There are a lot of scared people. There are a lot of lonely people, hurting people that could use someone putting them first. So this next week, let me ask you, what can you do to not only look to your own interests, but to look to the interests of others? What can you do? What can I do? We can all do something. I'm not talking about putting yourself in a place that's dangerous, but I am asking you, what can you do? We can all do something to minister to the needs of others. We've got to get our mind right to win. As we do, right attitudes will lead to right actions. And so what we learn from Paul is that he's teaching us that a right mind is humble. A right mind is selfless. It's a team and others oriented mind. It's not a self oriented mind. Paul is teaching us basically that a right mind is the mind of Christ. Everything that Paul's life modeled for the church at Philippi was modeled first 
and modeled perfectly by Jesus for all of us. Continuing on with our passage in Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 and 6. Have this mind, phronio, among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus. This is Paul's third and final use of that phrase, that word phronio, in our passage today. And he's choosing the same word over and over again to make sure that we're connecting the dots, that we're not missing the point that he's trying to make. And that's this, that one mind, that same mind, that humble mind, that selfless mind, this is the mind of Christ Jesus. This is the mind that the Holy Spirit develops in each and every believer as we spend time in his word being renewed by the word. And that's what it means for you and me to get our minds right. Continuing on with the passage, who though was in the form of God did not, account, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Let's stop right there. Based on the usage of the word grasp in English today, like something just beyond our grasp, something beyond our reach, a better word here actually would be the word gripped. Jesus didn't have to grasp for deity. He was, and he is, and he forever shall be God. Now, what this verse is really saying is that Christ came not to this world tightly gripping deity in his hands, holding it up to all, for all the world to say, hey, don't you realize who I am? I'm God. Look at this. You can't treat me this way. Jesus didn't do that Instead, he did exactly the opposite, continuing with the verse, but he emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. Jesus emptied himself, not of his deity, but of his privilege of deity. So back to our sport analogy, and this might be stretching it really way too far, but bear with me for just a moment. In our analogy, the Apostle Paul is our head coach. And the church at Philippi and every believer for all time, we're the players on the team. And Jesus is the owner of the team. And one day he decides that he wants to leave behind the air-conditioned VIP suite. And he wants to join the players down on the field. He wants to come down to the court. And he wants to put on a jersey. He wants to play on the team. And as the team's owner, well, that's his prerogative. And that's what Jesus did. And being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father, Philippians 2, 9 through 11. When Jesus put on the jersey, he didn't just play. He played to win. He left it all on the field. He wasn't just a valuable player on the team. He was the most valuable player of all time, the MVP of infinity. He secured the championship for the team. And through the example of his life and how he played the game, how Jesus played the game, he has left you and me with the playbook for hours. So by getting our mind right, we develop the mind of Christ. As we spend time in Christ's playbook, our minds get right. We develop right attitudes that lead to right actions. And that, that secures the right awards for us. As God honored Jesus for his obedience, Jesus hopes to one day honor you and me. He wants to honor us. At the end of the game of life, when the buzzer rings, there will be winners and there will be losers. Let's look at Matthew chapter 25, a passage there. We're not going to put it on the screen. You don't have to turn there. I'll read it to you. When the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations. And he will separate people from one, one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right and the goats on the left. And the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. 
these are the right awards. For I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty and you gave me drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you visited me. I was in prison and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you or thirsty and give you drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. You know, COVID-19 is presenting the church with an incredible, rare opportunity to minister to the least of these and to do it on the world stage. Everybody else is running the opposite direction. This is a prime opportunity for the church to be a witness for Christ. This is the tremendous playing field that has been set before our generation. We don't know when another opportunity is going to come like this again, if ever. Are we going to follow the lead of Jesus and play to win? Or are you and I, are we going to sit this one out on the sidelines? I want you to remember the mantra of Bruce Arians from the beginning of our message today. No risk it, no biscuit. No risk it, no biscuit. You know, in the passage of Matthew 25, there's a second group. There's a second group called the goats. The second group that chose to ignore the least of these. And Jesus' words to them were very different than his words to the sheep. Then he will say to those on his left, Depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and for his angels. Truly I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous to eternal life. So indeed, no risk it, no biscuit. Can I pray for us? Father God, Lord, thank you um, for an opportunity to join together for just a few minutes today around your word and to receive a personal challenge about how to respond to COVID-19 and to respond to the needs of others just for life in general. God, you have given us an incredible opportunity as a church to make a difference in the world. And Lord, I pray that you'll help us to do that during COVID-19 and during all times, Lord. You've called us to be salt and light. And so, Lord, with our eyes closed and our heads bowed, God, let us just pause for a moment and consider the things that we can do this next week to make a difference for someone that is really struggling with COVID-19. Maybe there's a coworker that uh, we still have some sort of connection with online that's just, well, they're freaking out. They're really starting to panic. And they could really use someone to come alongside them and offer them a strong word of encouragement, a word of hope, a hope that's grounded in reality, the reality of who you are and what you've done for us. And that's what they need. They need to hear that and they need someone to come alongside them and pray with them and share some truth and hope with them. God, maybe there's a, um, a single mom that lives across the hall in the condo and she's having a really hard time. She's out of work and she can't put food on the table right now for her kids or for herself. Maybe the next time we go out to the grocery store, we can pick up a few extra things and leave them in a box by her door. God, maybe in our village, there's an elderly couple and they can't go out and get their medicine right now. Maybe their, their adult children normally bring that to them, but because of the enhanced quarantine, they can't make it to mom and dad. Maybe we need to go and start building a relationship and find out what their needs are and help them get their medicines or whatever it is that they need, Father. There are so many different ways that we can make a difference during this time, and it really, really matters, and it can make a huge difference. Father God, lead us to those opportunities. They're all around us. Open our eyes to it, Lord. Help us to take appropriate risk, Lord, for the betterment and the advancement of your kingdom. Father God, we pray that you'll be with us during COVID-19, that you'll watch over us and protect us. 
God be with us until we can meet again next week. In Jesus' holy name, amen.